Mr. Liao Fan Yuan's actual name was Huang Yuan, alias Kun Yi. He was born in Wuqiang County, Jiangsu Province. When he was young, Mr. Yuan married into and lived with the family of his bride by the surname of Xu in Chaoshan County, Qiang Province. As a result, he was awarded a scholarship by Chaoshan County and became a government-supported student in the county. He passed the examination for Jiren in the township in the fourth year of the Longqing period during the Ming Dynasty under Emperor Mu Zhong. When Mr. Liao Fan was a student, he liked to study everything, whether ancient or modern, whether important or otherwise. He became an expert in astrology, law, irrigation, military affairs, politics and feng shui. Mr. Liao Fan's family was not rich, yet he liked to give alms. He led a thrifty and simple life by chanting Buddhist scriptures and incantations and sitting in meditation every day. No matter how busy his public or private affairs were, he never failed to sit quietly for his meditation sessions every morning and evening. He was 100% a philanthropist. Good morning, Father. Good morning, Tianji. Tianji, uh? go back to the house and study. All right, Father. I'll go now. Sesame cakes also. The price is eight cents. Oh, thank you, thank you. Have a nice day. Uh, yes. Steam bun, steam bun, hot steam bun, just fresh. Steam bun. Sick? What has happened to you? I'm not sick. No. 
I'm just very, very hungry. Oh, dear. Why have you left your house before taking your meal? I, I've come out to look for some food. Because there's nothing left back home. Some steam buns and sesame seed cakes. Please take them and, and eat. Oh, oh, oh. Oh. Mm. Mm. No. Eat slowly. Don't <laughs> choke. Eat slowly. <laughs> yeah, eat slowly. Getting cold. Take this money and buy some clothes. You're really a philanthropist. I wish to pay my last respect no, no, to you. Lady, don't say that. Don't say that. Don't please. If we don't have compassion for others, then we don't deserve to be humans. Don't. Please eat. My benefactor, what's your name? I want my descendants to, to remember your kindness forever. It is not necessary. Take good care of yourself. That's all I need. Father? What are you doing here? Well, I'm hoping to be placed in the first five positions. But my mind's trying to be confused. Looks like there's no hope. You have to be patient. Impatience is not a virtue. Father, I don't know why my mind can't be calmed down. It looks as if I'm fated not to come out top. As long as you're willing to study hard and try your best to do good works, you can change your own destiny. It is often said, refraining from all wrongdoing and practicing all forms of kindness brings about a reduction of distress and the coming of fortune. This is the basic principle behind creating one's destiny. Is it so? But all the people in the temples have said that our fate is predestined. How then can it be changed? This is merely the viewpoint of ordinary people. No wonder you are confused. Mm, okay. Let me relate my own experience as an example for you, so you may understand it much better. Yes, you will understand. Sit down. Mm. 
My father passed away when I was young, and mother persuaded me to learn medicine instead of becoming a scholar. In her opinion, learning medicine would be a good way to support myself and to help others. Besides, having a skill, I would never have to worry about making a living. And I could even become famous, according to her. This was my father's wish for me. I listened to mother and gave up the idea of becoming a government official. Until one day, when I went to the Compassionate Cloud Temple. Good morning, Your Eminence. Gentlemen, from your facial appearance, you are destined to become a government official. Moreover, you will attain the rank of erudite first level scholar next year. Why don't you study then? Oh, <laughs> this is because um, my mother said to me, he appeared to me to be a sincere person. So I told him my reason for giving up studies to learn medicine. I also asked him about his life experience. My last name is Kong. I come from Yunnan province. I have inherited the knowledge of Mr. Kang Xie Shao, who developed the art of prediction very well. My calculations, I am supposed to pass it on to you. Thank you. Thank you, Master. Thank you, Master. Please follow me. So I invited Mr. Kong to stay in the house and told my mother about him. Please have some tea. Mrs. Yuan, yeah. forgive me for being direct. Five generations ago, your Yuan family was a flourishing one. Unfortunately, after a disaster in spring 47 years ago, you were the only surviving family member in the whole clan. Moreover, your husband died at a young age. <sighs> Mr. Kong, you're really a master of fortune teller. Even a disaster a few decades ago cannot escape from your calculation. <laughs> You're indeed a living immortal. You flatter me. I only made my conclusions based on the art of prediction. No wonder it is so accurate. <sighs> Mr. Kong is such an expert in the art of prediction. Why don't you ask him to help predict your destiny? Yes, mother. Believing what Mr. Kong had said, I began to study again to prepare for the examination for erudite first level scholar. Once again, Mr. Kong made a prediction for me. According to him, as a student, I would place 14th in the county examination, 
71st in the regional examination and 9th in the provincial examination. The following year, at the three places of examination, I placed exactly as he predicted. Then I asked Mr. Kong to calculate the predictions for my entire life. The results of his predictions were that I would pass such and such a test in such and such a year, I would become a civil servant in such a year, and in such a year I would receive a promotion. Finally, I would be appointed as a magistrate in Sichuan province. After holding that office for three and a half years, I would resign and return home. At the age of 53, I would die around two o'clock in the morning on August 14th. It was fated that I would not have a son. Father, are these predictions wrong? Now you are over 60 years old and I'm your own son. Let me continue. From then on, the outcome of every examination I took turned out exactly as Mr. Kong had predicted. Mr. Kong predicted that I would be promoted only after receiving a salary in the weight of 91 dans and 5 doors of rice. However, I had received only 71 dans of rice when a senior education official recommended me for a promotion. I secretly began to doubt Mr. Kong's predictions. Nevertheless, the prediction turned out to be correct after all, because the recommendation was turned down by his superior. It was not until several years later when Mr. Chiu Min Ying saw my old examination papers and exclaimed that the essays were well written and it would be a pity to bury the talents of such a great scholar. Mr. Ying wanted their magistrate to issue an official order for me to become a candidate for imperial student under his authority. After undergoing this eventful promotion, my calculations showed that I had received exactly 91 dance and 5 doors of rice. From then on, whether it was promotion, rank or wealth, I deeply believe that all came about in due time and that the length of one's life is predestined. I began to view everything in a more detached manner and ceased to seek gain and profit. After being selected as an imperial student, I was to attend a university at Peking. During my year-long stay at the capital, my interest in meditation grew and I often sat silently without giving rise to a single thought. I lost interest in books and did not study at all. One day I paid a visit to the enlightened Zen master Yung Gu at Chishia Mountain. This visit changed my whole destiny. Mr. Yuan. Master. The reason why ordinary people are unable to attain sagehood is because they have too many wandering and false thoughts running through their minds. In our three-day meditation, I have not observed the slightest wandering thought arising from you. Why is this so? 
Mr. Kong has clearly predicted the entire outcome of my life. The time of life, death, promotion and failure are all predestined. There is no use or need for me to think about it. I thought you were someone of remarkable capabilities. Now I realize you are nothing but a common mundane person. Master, please explain what you meant. An average person's mind is forever occupied by wandering and imaginary thoughts. So, naturally, his life is bound by the Shi of Yin and Yang as well as fate. We cannot deny the fact that fate exists, but only ordinary people are bound by it. Fate cannot bind those who cultivate great kindness. This is because their virtues accrued from kind acts are so great that these acts will alter their original destiny for the better. The merits accrued can actually change their destiny from suffering to happiness, poverty to prosperity, and short lives to long lives. Similarly, fate cannot bind who commit great wrongdoing. When a person's bad deeds are so great and powerful, they will cancel out the good fortune and prosperity predetermined in his original fate. And his life can be transformed from good to bad. For the past 20 years, you have lived your life according to Mr. Kong's predictions and did not do a thing to change it. Instead, you became bound by your own fate. If you are not considered an ordinary mortal, then who is? Can one escape from his fate then? <laughs> We create our own fate. Good or bad fortune is also determined by ourselves. When I commit bad deeds, disasters are bound to strike. When I cultivate kindness, good fortune will naturally come my way. It says so in all the great ancient books of wisdom. In the Buddhist teachings, it is written that if one wishes for and seeks wealth, position, a son, a daughter, or longevity, one can attain them. One only has to cultivate kind deeds in order to escape the control of fate. Since untruthful speech is one of the greatest offenses in Buddhist teachings, we can be assured that these are not lies. Buddhas and Bodhisattvas certainly have no reasons to deceive us. Hmm. But Mencius once said, oh, whatever is sought for can be attained. The seeking is in oneself. This refers to inner qualities such as virtue, kindness and morality. These are all qualities we can work toward. However, when it comes to outside factors such as wealth, fame and prestige, how can we seek to attain them? Don't these have to be granted by others? Mencius was correct, but you misinterpreted his meaning. Hu Ning, the sixth patriarch of the Zen school, has taught that all the fields of merit are within one's own heart. The outside is merely a reflection of the inside. By seeking within ourselves, we can not only attain the inner qualities of virtue, kindness and morality, but we can also attain wealth, fame, prestige. These are embodied in one's fate. One will attain them, even without having to seek. Therefore, if one cannot reflect within one's own heart, but instead blindly seek from outside, then this search is in vain.
By the way, Mr. Kong has predicted that you will not receive an imperial appointment nor get a son, hasn't he? Yes, he has. If this is your fate, then you should reflect on your past deeds. What are your feelings? Those who receive imperial appointments all have the appearance of good fortune, and I do not. I am very impatient, intolerant, indisciplined, and speak without restraint. I also have a strong sense of pride and arrogance. How is it possible for me to receive an imperial appointment? There is an old saying, life springs from the dirt of the earth, and water too clean often harbors no fish. The first reason why I feel I do not deserve a son is because I am addicted to cleanliness, resulting in the lack of thoughtfulness for others. The second reason is that harmony is the cultivator of all life, but I have a quick temper. The third reason is based on the principle that loving kindness is the basis of reproduction and harshness is the root of sterility. I overly guard my own reputation and cannot sacrifice anything for the sake of others. The fourth reason is that I talk too much, which wastes a lot of chi or energy. The fifth reason is that I also delight in drinking alcohol and that depletes my spirit. The sixth reason I do not have a son is my habit of staying up nights, not knowing how to conserve my energy. According to you then, there are too many things in life you do not deserve. Not only fame and a son. We should know that both good and bad fortune are all formed from one's heart. Whether a person should enjoy fortune or starve to death are only consequences of their own actions and thoughts. The heaven merely leads the happening of events according to the forces of nature and does not impose any interference. This is just like the weight of a person. Depends on his own content and not that the balance is being partial. Do you understand? Similarly, Bearing children depends on the kind of virtue accumulated by a person. For example, if a person has accumulated enough merit and virtue for a hundred generations, then he or she will have descendants to last a hundred generations. For those who have no descendants at all, it is because they may have amassed sins instead. Mr. Kong has predicted that you will not receive an imperial appointment or have a son. We can think of these as the results of your past misdeeds, but even that can still be changed. If you can intensify your good deeds by doing more charitable works, then the merits accumulated by you will result in your receiving good reward. I understood and believed in the Master. And I began to repent of all my past wrongdoings in front of the Buddha image. I wrote down my wish to pass the imperial examinations and I vowed to complete 3,000 meritorious deeds to show my gratitude towards heaven, earth and ancestors. Master Yun Gu showed me a chart and he taught me how to keep a daily record of the kind and evil acts I committed. The kind acts, they were to be recorded at the top portion and evil acts at the bottom of the chart. He told me that bad deeds could neutralize the merits I accrue from good deeds. The master also taught me how to recite the Junti mantra. Junti zhou. Ji shou gui su xi di. Tou mian ding li qi ju zhi. Wo jin cheng zan da junti. 
唯愿慈悲垂家户。Mantra writing experts once said, "Those who practiced the art but do not know the right way to do it will be laughed at by gods and spirits." The secret behind writing mantras is the absence of thought from start to finish. In the process of writing, one must not give rise to a single improper thought. Even kind thoughts have to be let go of. Only under these circumstances can a mantra be successful. Let's try. When one prays. Or seek something in terms of changing fate. It is important that one does it when the mind is still. In this way, wishes will be easily fulfilled. Mencius stated in his principle of forming destiny that there is no difference between longevity and short life. At first glance, one would find this hard to understand. How can longevity and short life be the same? In actuality, when we look within our hearts. We will find no duality, no difference. We should see everything with eyes of equality and live morally, regardless of good or bad times. If one can practice accordingly, then one can master the fate of wealth and poverty. Therefore, when we are Able to create and form our own destiny, it does not matter whether we are presently rich or poor. Just as a wealthy man should not become callous in his thoughts and actions because he is rich, a poor man should not resort to committing evil deeds due to his poverty. In either case, one should keep to one's place in society and be a virtuous person. The actions of worldly people usually follow their thoughts. So whatever has to be thought is not considered natural. Accomplish the state of no thought by reciting the Junti mantra continuously to overcome scattered thoughts in the mind. And when you recite, you must not think of reciting, but recite consciously and diligently without any attachment. When the reciting becomes second nature to you, it will be. Efficacious. My name used to be Xue Hai, which meant broad learning. But after having understood the fact that destiny is created by ourselves, I changed it to Liao Fan, which means transcending the mundane. Because I did not wish to be like worldly people who allow destiny to control them. Oh, I see. From then on, I began to be constantly aware of my thoughts and actions. Soon, I felt quite different from before. I became respectful, careful, and conservative in my thoughts, speech, and actions. I maintain this attitude even when I am alone, for I know that there are spirits and gods everywhere. Who can see my every action and thought? Even when I encounter people who slander me, 
I can take their insults with a patient and peaceful mind. The year after I met Master Yun Gu, I took the preliminary imperial exam in which Mr. Kong had predicted I would come in third place. Amazingly, I came in first. Mr. Kong's predictions were beginning to lose their accuracy. Emanation, but I did. Master Yun Gu had said that destiny could be changed, and now I believe it more than ever. Although I had corrected a lot of my faults, I found that I could not wholeheartedly do the things I ought to do. Even if I did, it was forced and unnatural. I reflected within and found that there were still many things wrong in not being eager enough to do it, or harboring doubts when helping others in need. Sometimes I forced myself to act kindly, but my speech was still untamed and offensive. I found that I could contain myself when sober, but after a few drinks, I would lose self-discipline and act without restraint. Although I often practiced kind deeds and accumulated merits, my good deeds were offset by my faults and offenses. A lot of my time was spent vainly and without value. It took me more than ten years to complete the three thousand meritorious deeds I had vowed to do. I was unable to dedicate the merits from these three thousand kind deeds at a temple until I returned to my hometown a few years later. Then I made my second wish, and that was for a son. I vowed to complete another three thousand good deeds. One year later, you were born. Every time I performed a kind deed, I would record it in a book. Your mother, who could not write, would use a goose feather dipped in ink and make a red circle on the calendar for every kind deed she did. Sometimes she gave food to the poor or bought living creatures from the marketplace to free them in the wild. She recorded all these with her circles on the calendar. At times she performed more than ten kind deeds in a single day. We continued to perform and accumulate kind deeds in this manner, and in a mere two years, the three thousand deeds were completed. Once again, I made another wish in the temple, and that was to pass the next level in the imperial examination, the Jinsher level. I also vowed to complete ten thousand meritorious deeds. After three years, I attained my wish and passed the Jinsha level. I was made the district officer of Baudi County. While in the office, I prepared a small booklet to record my merits and faults and called it the Book of Disciplining the Mind. I told the door guard to place the booklet on my desk every morning. From that day, I recorded all my good and bad deeds in that booklet. Every evening I would burn incense and make a report of my deeds to the heavens at a little altar in the garden. Once, your mother was concerned when she saw that I had not accumulated many merits. Then she asked, In the past I was able to help you in your accumulation of kind deeds and we were able to complete the three thousand meritorious deeds. Now you have made a vow to complete ten thousand kind deeds, and there are fewer opportunities to practice them here at the government residence. How long will it be before your vow can be fulfilled? That night, after your mother spoke the words, I had a dream. Fang Yuan. Uh, my heavenly lord. Why are you unable to sleep? My lord, this is this is because I have made a vow to complete ten thousand meritorious deeds, but to date I have not achieved good results. 
I am afraid this vow will never be achieved during my living time. When you became the district officer, you reduced the taxes on the rice fields. That was a great kind deed. And that deed itself was worth 10,000 merits. Your vow is already fulfilled. As it turned out, the farmers in Baudi County had to pay a very high tax, and when I came to office, I reduced the taxes on the rice fields by nearly half. But I still held doubts and wondered how a single deed could be worth 10,000 merits. Coincidentally, the Zen master Huan Yu was traveling from the five plateau mountains of Shanxi province and stopped in Baudi. I invited him over and told him of my dream and asked whether it was believable. Master Huan Yu said, when doing kind deeds, one must be true and sincere and not seek any rewards or act with falsity. If one does a kind deed with such a true and sincere heart, then one deed can be worth the merit from 10,000 kind deeds. Besides, your act of reducing the taxes in this county benefits more than 10,000 people. You have relieved the suffering of heavy taxes on all these farmers. Upon hearing his words, I gave a month's salary for him to take back and use the money to offer food for 10,000 monks and dedicate the merits for me. My father, what happened after that? Mr. Kong had predicted that I would die at the age of 53. However, I survived that year with no illnesses, though I did not ask the heavens for a longer life. Now I am 69 already. In Buddhist teachings, it is written, The way of the heavens is undetermined, and neither is one's destiny. It is also said, Destiny is not set, but is only created and determined by oneself. These are all true, and I have come to understand that both fortune and adversity are all the results of one's own doing. Destiny is not something fixed, but can be changed. Father, I wonder how my life will be. This is not important. In any case of destiny, we should always prepare for the worse. Therefore, even in times of prosperity, you must act as if you were not. And when things are going your way, you must be mindful of adversity. When you are wealthy, be mindful of poverty. And when loved and respected by all, you must remain careful and conservative. When the family is greatly respected and revered, you must carry yourself humbly. And when your learning is broad and deep, you must not display it but keep it humbly within. These six ways of contemplation just mentioned by me are a means to tackle the problem from its opposite side. If one can thus cultivate the mind, then virtue and morality will grow and fortune will increase on its own. There are many intelligent people in the world who refuse to cultivate morality and virtue and cannot put forth diligent effort in their work. Their failures later in life are owed to a single word, laziness. In short, the teachings of Master Yun Gu are truly the most worthy, profound, real and 
proper teachings. And I hope that you will study them closely and practice them with all your effort. You must use your time wisely and not let it slip by in vain. Do you understand? I know, Father. Thank you for your teaching. saints or sages, Confucius once said, one with faults should not fear to correct them. As such, when we have made a mistake, don't be afraid to correct it. During the spring-autumn period, many prestigious advisors and counselors of nations were able to accurately predict whether a person's future would be good, bad, disastrous or fortunate based on their observations of that person's speech and behavior. These can be seen recorded in several history books. Mm -hmm. What methods did they use to make predictions? Uh, usually there are signs which signal impending danger or of coming good fortune. These signs are a reflection of one's heart. Though it is the heart from which thoughts arise, the body and its limbs can fully portray a person's character. For instance, if a person is kind-hearted, then his or her every gesture will indicate steadiness and stolidity. If this behavior portrays kindness, then you will know for sure in advance that his good fortune is not far behind. On the contrary, when we see unkind behavior from a person, we will know that troubles await him or her. Uh. Then, how do we make corrections? Hmm. There are three ways to reform one's faults. First, one must feel shame. As the saying goes, one who knows shame is not far from being a courageous person. Think of all the ancient saints and sages whose names and teachings have lasted through hundreds of generations. They were the people just like us. Why is my name tarnished and my reputation ruined in just one lifetime? I find that it is because I overindulge myself in material pleasures and have been badly influenced by the polluted environment. I also secretly do many things I am not supposed to do and think others won't know about it. Sometimes I disregard the nation's laws and am not ashamed of it. Without realizing it, I stoop lower each day until I am no different from an animal. There is nothing else in the world which calls for more shame and remorse than these behaviors. Mencius once said, Shame is the greatest and most important word in a person's lifetime. Why? Because one who knows shame will put forth his best effort in reforming faults and will eventually attain sagehood or become a saint. The second way to reform is that one must know fear. What are we to fear? We must know that the heaven, earth, spirits and gods all hover over our heads in observation. They are different from man in that they can see everything without obstruction. Therefore, it is not easy to deceive them. If my offense is serious, then all kinds of disasters will befall me. If the fault is minor, it will still deduct from my current fortune. How can I not feel fear? Therefore, we must fear the spirits and gods every moment. Even I'm in an empty room, the spirits and gods watch over me very carefully and records everything. We can try covering up our evil doings from others, but the spirits and gods can see through to our hearts and know our every action. Ultimately, we cannot deceive ourselves. 
We would feel embarrassed and dishonored if others happened to see our misdeeds. Therefore, how can we not be constantly cautious of our every action and be fearful of the consequences they might evoke? But there is more to it. As long as a person still has one breath left, then he has the chance to repent of the most serious mistakes and offenses. If a person can have an overwhelming and courageous kind thought at the most important moment, then it can cleanse away hundreds of years of accumulated sins. This is just like how only one lamp is necessary to bring light into a valley that has been dark for a thousand years. Sit, sit, sit. Besides, we are living in a tumultuous and constantly changing world. Our body, being made of flesh and blood, is extremely perishable. If our next breath does not come, then this body will no longer be part of us. By then, even if we did want to reform, we would not have the chance to do so. Therefore, when you commit evil, your retribution in the physical world is a bad reputation and name which will last for hundreds and thousands of years. Even filial children and loving grandchildren cannot cleanse your name for you. Whereas in your afterlife, you might end up in hell suffering immeasurable pain. Even Buddhas and Bodhisattvas cannot save you. So how can one not be fearful? Father, is there any other way? Yes, there is. The third way is, one must have determination and courage. A person who hesitates to reform his faults is one who really does not want to change, but is content with what he can get away with. His willpower may not be strong enough, making him afraid to change his wrongdoings. A minor fault is like a thorn sticking into our flesh and should be quickly removed. A big fault is like a finger bitten by a poisonous snake. We must cut off that finger without hesitation to prevent the poison from spreading and taking our life. There are also three methods of practice in helping us reform. First is changing through action, second is changing through reasoning, and third is changing from the heart. Since the methods vary, so do the results of change. For example, if I killed living beings in the past, I now vow not to kill again starting today. If I was angry and yelled at others in the past, I vow not to get angry starting today. This is how a person changes through action. However, this is merely suppressing yourself not to do something. And it is difficult to achieve the objective of getting rid of your faults permanently. A more ideal method is changing through reasoning. In the case of killing animals, one can think thus. Loving all living things is a virtue of heaven. All living things love life and are afraid to die. How can I be at peace with myself by taking another's life to nurture my own? We should know that the way to healthiness lies in the utilization of our energy and not delicacies. We can be nourished just as well by consuming vegetarian food. Why let your stomach become a graveyard? If you think about it, you will naturally feel sorry for these animals and be unable to swallow their flesh. The same holds true for changing one's bad temper. One should think of the fact that everyone is not the same and has his or her individual strengths and weaknesses. And as such, we should understand and accommodate one another. If someone offends me for no reason at all, then it is his problem, and that has nothing to do with me. There is no reason for me to get angry. Therefore, no benefit, but rather harm, is derived from killing animals and getting angry. There are other faults and offenses we can change along the same lines. 
If we can understand the reasoning behind the need to reform, we will not make the same mistake twice. Though a person's fault can amount to thousands of different types, they all stem from thoughts of the mind. Tianqi, come here. If your heart is rooted in vices such as desire, fame, profits or anger, you don't have to find ways to get rid of each fault. All you need is a sincere, kind heart and the willingness to practice kind deeds. As long as your heart is virtuous and kind, then naturally your mind will not generate any improper thoughts. All mistakes stem from the heart. Therefore, one should change from the heart. Do you understand? Yes, I do. If we are willing to cultivate our hearts, then it is possible to purify our thoughts right away. And this is because wrongdoings originate from the heart. Purifying the heart can erase all improper and bad thoughts before they are carried out in action. The best way is by cultivating the heart and understanding the reason behind the need to change. The alternative way is forcing ourselves not to commit the wrongdoing again. Sometimes all three methods have to be used to succeed at reforming a fault.